Yeah, uh, I have a Zoom account. I pay for a Zoom thought, account. You thought you were going to miss, <laughs> didn't want to miss that. I, I did. bit. How much is I, a Zoom account that you pay for? Well, I, I got to take my business seriously, Colt. And I take my myself very seriously. I have to, I have to pay for it. Do you have another option? Because I'll cancel well, my Zoom account. The Zoom used to be free for, but then for 40 minutes. one meetings. But 40 minutes. No, it used to be 40 minutes if you wanted more than one person. It used to be oh. free if it was one-on-one -on -one forever. And then they just recently made it 40 minutes for one-on-one. -on -one. So I've taken my business elsewhere. The opening to this is the greatest is of you questioning my payment for Zoom and how rich I must be because I pay for Zoom. That's it. That right there, I feel, couldn't describe <laughs> us in a nutshell more. And that's... <laughs> but I feel like it's you're like that with 95% of your friends. Well, it's just I, it's my curiosity of the world of how everyone just doesn't want to pinch every single penny as much as they possibly can. <laughs> I'm okay. blown away when well, people put money into anything. <laughs> well, let's start there. How? What, has this always been you? Yeah. My dad, my dad is a penny pincher. My dad is a known penny pincher. Very, very frugal. A coupon cutter everything to this day a rebate guy does everything. he have does he have money yeah yeah i wouldn't say he's like loaded but he's he's well off yeah i mean so, i have money yes but <laughs> we'll get to that later as well <laughs> but when like was this a throughout your life thing a in wrestling thing on the road when did it hit like, hey, I might be a bit over the top of a penny pincher because I'd say you are very over the top of a penny pincher. <laughs> well, on some things I am on, on some things I'm not, you know, like it's the other day I went and bought some something for my dog and I was just like, I can't. I know there's a coupon out here for PetSmart somewhere, but I just can't be bothered. I'll pay the thirty dollars or whatever it is. So if I in a different world, I would have, you know, like I would have searched my. I mean, I did download the app, but I just couldn't find the coupons. So I just, so okay. I, I just gave up. I just gave up on it. But I really, you know, when I was, uh, when I wanted to be a wrestler full time and that was the only thing I wanted to do and I didn't want to do anything else, it was just like, I, I have to have a lifestyle that allows me to make the, the $30 I'll make for a payday and the $30 I'll make for selling one VHS tape one t-shirt and two pictures that I made at my job off the color copier. Uh, I, you know, that's like, I, I needed that to sustain me as a job. So I knew like I couldn't live a luxurious life, nor did I want to, because I would trade off living the life as a, of a pro wrestler for li for having to do some other job, but being very wealthy. So, so that was my first love was my first love wasn't being wealthy. My first love was living the life of a pro wrestler, being a full time pro wrestler. So it was uh, I, I stapled working, it in myself. Yeah. You were working a real job while independent wrestling, while while starting out, obviously. Or did you immediately? Nope. No, I'm doing just this. No, I, I mean, I went to college, you know, like yep. in between freshman and sophomore year. It's where I learned how to wrestle. And then I continued my education. Um, and then after I graduated and still wrestling every weekend, I was a teaching assistant for two years. But it, there comes to the point where every wrestler who is an independent wrestler who feels they can make it full time, there comes to a point where you're making like kind of enough money where you're like, oh, maybe I could do this for a living. But it's never you, it's not like you just get to the point of independent wrestler to like full time independent wrestler. And now all of a sudden you're making six figures that wouldn't be a, a full-time independent wrestler. That'd probably be a full-time contracted wrestler. That, that right there, just what you said, I have a thing later written down, but it brings up now you are the literally the, the sketchbook drawing of an independent wrestler. 
like the exact outline and layout is you. And I chubby white guy. Yes, you're right. (laughs) (laughs) I feel there's so much that you say in interviews and in, in all of this stuff that always clicks back to independent wrestler and always clicks back to, Hey, this is how you do it. And everyone just needs to follow that. And I, I, I truly believe that. And I've always believed that where you are the epitome of an independent wrestler in everything you've done. If and that's I, the path you want to take, but like, there's some people who just get right on AEW or WWE and they yeah. can do it for 20 years. And they, and that isn't the path. Like it, it proves that you don't have to take that path. And was that always your mindset of I'm going to do this. And if I luck out or was it a, Hey, I need to, <clears throat> excuse me. I need to get there. And I, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? No, I, I, so I assumed I would never get to the WWE. I whole time. Your whole, whole time. Okay. My whole life. I didn't look at, I mean, especially starting off in all of that stuff, or even in my childhood, I didn't look at, I knew my genetics. I knew uh, what I was. I say my genetics and then I'm talking to, to Swaggle, but um, <laughs> what, what a prick I am. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I was getting there either, by the way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because of my genetics as well. <laughs> right. Right. And so it's just like, well, but I want to do this for a living. So I have to figure out a way to make the most amount of money that isn't provided by WWE. And I knew that was like, that came with hustling. And I knew that came with like trying to figure out how to, to get money from all different sources of revenue while being a wrestler. Um, because, you know, you realize, uh, you know, I, I think when we were starting out, like I, I remember in 1999 or 2000 and hearing that scrap iron, Adam Pierce was getting paid $300 by the insane clown posse. And That's a ton of money. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I remember when I got a hundred dollars for a random show when I when I was about first started. And I was like, I've I'm a millionaire. Should I give this, this back? A- Should I give <laughs> this back? <laughs> OK, but if you like if I'm 19 and then I look at it, it's like three hundred dollars. Well, then you have to work what like I can't do the math, but a hundred. It's not even three. You have to do so many shows. It wouldn't even make a real living, but just the idea of like $300 to you, you, that's the, that's the very top of the top is $300 at the independent scene. So, you know, obviously the WWE guys were making whatever, but I just didn't think I would be able to make that. So that was your, your, always your, your mindset when you broke in and throughout of, Hey, I need to be the best independent wrestler. No, wait, what? Like I was never going to be said, the best. It's like Loki no, 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 was, no, Loki was uh, wrestling on cards. I'm not me. saying, I'm not saying in, in ring, but I need to be the, I want to be the biggest independent wrestler because you had the mindset of, I'm not going to go there or there. It wasn't the big, it was, I need to, to tap. I need to tap out some kind of s- skill or niche in order okay. to make money. So, you know, I, I was just talking about this with my friend. It was just like, you know, there was a time where I was going down to Mexico and I was getting Lucha masks and I would buy them on the streets and then sell them at wrestling shows because I was doing so many shows. And that's how I was making my money. And I was like, that's how I paid my bills for years was selling those Lucha masks at independent shows. And I wasn't trying to be the best independent wrestler. I was trying to find ways to make money within wrestling. Now, so you like, wouldn't have to have a regular job while doing so it. Has a regular job, but you have to realize that, like. In order to be on these shows, to sell Lucha masks, you have to be good. And so I did want to get really good at my job so I can continue being on shows. And that's another part of it is like you have to up your skill set in order to get booked on shows and like shows all over the place. And this was also something that came in later with the, the success of the art of wrestling is if I wasn't booked on so many shows all over the world, I wouldn't be able to sit down with all those guests like I did. And I did. I sat down and that was, I think, part of the charm of the show is that I sat down in person and it's like, well, how does this, you know, like at the time, comedy podcasts were only in L.A. So you'd only get the actors in L.A. But I was a wrestling podcast that went everywhere. And it was like, yeah, because I would literally be in Vancouver one day, Colorado the next day, Florida the next day, Seattle the next day. And then I would be in locker rooms with all these different people. And so th- I was only able to do that because I was skilled as a pro wrestler. And then later on, I was able to do that because I was skilled as a podcaster. And so yeah. people would want me on their shows so they could promote their promote wrestling the show. show. Yeah. yeah. 
that's that's something you another thing like uh, besides the just being the indie guy is you've always been on the cusp of everything everything that's cool and like <laughs> and it like it it, it it blows my mind because our, our our with our friendship and it's always like hey i'm doing this and i go i don't even know about that and then it hits and then i'm doing this and then it hits from the art of wrestling to uh, the, the wrestling road diaries and the documentary series. I mean, you were essentially, a, there was beyond the mat, but there's not the indie wrestling documentary out there mm -hmm. until the wrestling road diaries. And those gave such a unique look into three separate car loads, let's say, and uh, sets of characters living this life and living the life that you were just talking about, about the life of a type of wrestler and how to make things work when you're not here. How, like, is that something you always kind of seek out of what's going to hit next? Or does it just, is it just something that you find kind of falling in your lap? If that makes sense. Well, it's hard as I get older because I did, <laughs> You know, we're not as cool anymore, right? Like, yeah. so it's you asking Landon, my son, right? My son, yeah, that's 100%, 100%. I literally just said to him the other day, I said, hey. What's cool? Why why, why is, is Instagram becoming a thing more than Twitter? Like, it seems Wait, like it's- you, you asked this hopefully four years ago, right? I asked this last weekend. <laughs> I, I asked this last weekend. So the question and, to be would be like, why is- TikTok more than Instagram, or why is be real Listen, a thing? Do you know what be real is? No, is that nope, nope. I I don't know at all. I okay, we're gonna hit back on this for sure. But I I just don't TikTok. I cannot. Do, I still can't do. You did the TikTok thing about the when we you put me on TikTok. Yeah, we got a million hits with that one. And I still don't know what that is. And I still don't get what that means. I don't, yeah. I don't, I just, I, I, but you've, that proves how you're literally on the cusp of everything. And so you were like, like you said, I, I go to land and up because we got to kind of figure out what's going to hit. How do you, how does that happen with you? You because you're always about it. Wrestling is behind, has always been behind the times always. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like to consider myself in the times and so the stuff that I do is only stuff that hits me and hits my heart. So like podcast, I was listening to so many podcasts, so many comedy podcasts, and I was almost obsessed with it. And then it was just like, well, well, this makes sense. Let's transform this over to the wrestling world. Uh, the documentary, like I love the independent comedy scene. Um, so there was a, uh, there was a documentary called the comedians of comedy with Pat Oswalt and Brian Posehn and Zach Galifianakis from like 2004, or 2005 or something. And it like, it showed that world. And I was kind of like seeking out more stuff of that. And I just said to myself, well, we should implement that into professional wrestling. And, um, and so again, like it is getting a little harder as I'm not, you know, uh, in the graphs of what pop culture is as a 42 year old man is, you know, <laughs> in, if it was, if, you know, being a 24 year old kid or whatever I was at the time. So, but I do, I do try to stay up on everything and I do try to stick with the trends and, um, and also, and before the trends, but if you're just with the trends in normal life, you're ahead of the curve in pro wrestling. Cause it's so behind the times. And, you know, now that, uh, Vince McMahon maybe isn't part of that show anymore, like in WWE represents like the very, very tippity top of like wrestling for so many years, obviously AEW is trying to put a stronghold on that, but you know, like maybe there will be a change in wrestling, not being so behind the times, but it's still a, it's still a 55 year old man in charge. Like until they put a 24 year old in charge, you know, you like, wonder, you wonder and, how and, crazy and I'll, say, so, I'll cut you up. But like when, when, when Paul Heyman was in charge and how cool wrestling was like, that's yeah. You know what I'm saying? Paul Heyman yeah. ECW was so cool. And Paul Heyman wasn't a, a, a 55 year old man. You wonder if it would register the same, you know what I mean? If to the, to the huge, to the broad audience and not just be a, you know, a, a niche kind of thing. If the, the hip person were in charge. Yeah. It's, I mean, you know, I mean, to Tony's a little, a little younger than me, 
And I, you know, I've talked to Tony enough to know that like, he's up on like kind of what's cool and what's happening yeah. in pop culture. So, you know, and, and AEW definitely has a different vibe than WWE. Um, so I think it's a start, you know? Um, but you know, like that, just like if you put the 25 year old Gen Z guy in charge, you know, like it's very, I'm sure so many mistakes would happen, but it'd be fun to watch. It would be real fun to watch. And it would be fun <laughs> to see if people absorb it or not, or if it's just like, Oh, yeah. this is too out there. It'd be a great me. experiment, but it'd be so expensive. It'd be such an expensive experiment. <laughs> yeah, real big risk to take because of it. Because also I think wrestling fans are used to the behind the times a little, as much as they're in this life. Right. Common wrestling fans or the they're used to wrestling being here mm-hmm. and then catching up eventually or if at yeah. all. Yeah. What well, was like when we were younger, there was like uh, a Bischoff was a part of that thing called Matt rats. Do you remember that? No. We're like Jack there was a and- local, there was a local, all like the local wrestling clubs were called Matt rats. Like the, the, oh. the amateur wrestling. It was all no, no, th- this was like, they had the foresight to put um, like springs above the, the top, like on the, on the corner posts. So people could do crazier stuff. It was like Jack Evans and TJ Wilson. Yeah. And Teddy Hart, they had like a, a box with springs. So you could do like extra cool stuff. And so like, that's what I think of, of just like someone being like, we got to make this cooler. Like, that seems <laughs> so dangerous. So da- like, of course. <laughs> and it's all like eight, 18 I'm- year old kids. <laughs> I took it as Matt, whenever TJ would talk about Matt rats, I took it as literally amateur wrestling, but doing like real, like professional wrestling moves on that. No, I think it was pretty forward thinking for its time and it just didn't hit. Huh? So instead of just wanting to hear your own answers, why don't you listen to him when he talks about it? That's very true. Yeah. hundred okay. percent. Thanks guy. <laughs> yeah. So in that also we're talking about TJ and, and that, you doing the podcast with your travels, but also when you were doing the podcast, you were doing interviews with WWE people like contracted wrestlers, which was another thing that was mind blowing at the time because no one did that. No one from the independent kind of thing had these public interviews with contracted people. And it wasn't ever like allowed. People weren't allowed to just come in and Hey, set up the microphone, do it. But you always had a relationship with everyone because of your, your they say that the journeyman thing, but you've had a relationship with everyone in wrestling period. And where, like how, I, yeah, no, you have hundred percent. You have hundred percent. You've some, had like some of the, some of the name, new crew. I don't. Yeah. That, but there's not anyone. I don't feel that I can think of that. You don't have a relationship of some kind. Is that just, your personality is that just you or is it you taking chances of hey let's interview let's let's reach out to this person see if they'll do one well uh, for the most part the show was only people i knew and my friends especially for the first 200 episodes so uh well you know it's not like i was allowed to do that with the wwe wrestlers the thing is is that again behind the times in 2000 i started that show in 2010 from 2010 to 2014 WWE didn't even know what a podcast was not only that, I had pitched them the idea beforehand while my show was getting successful, telling them that, like, I remember the email I sent just being like, this is working really well for me. I'm selling so much merch. Imagine, like, we have each person on and then we, we you know, like, I get to sit down with Randy Orton. We talk about real life and then we sell his his shirt and we, we push shop zone. And they just were like, at the time, they said to me, um, we're not, we're a visual, not an audio, uh, you know, because that market um, she, wasn't there for them yet. Like they had no they, idea. Right. They had, and they had no foresight at the time. And I was in it. It wasn't even like foresight. I was like making the most money I'd ever made, including wrestling for WWE, you know, by just talking to my yeah. friends and not necessarily by, I wasn't really making any money from the podcast itself. I didn't, I never really got paid for it until about three or four years in, but um, the, the business I was doing with my merchandise and all and, and bookings and, and the tables that I was, you know, selling stuff to this whole new audience who wanted to support me. Um, that was, so that was like, um, that was them being behind the times. And then, yeah, like um, I would just, it's just, I've just been on so many shows still. And like, I've just wrestled so many shows and so many places. I was never a person who just wanted to stay in Chicago. You know, I couldn't even get booked in Chicago the first year of my career uh, because my trainers weren't very well liked in the city. So we could only get work oh. outside, you know, because they were my trainers. So they were the ones vouching for me and 
no one wanted to take their vouching the in Chicago. It's almost black, blackballed in your own hometown. For the most part, yeah. And so, you know, I, I jumped at the chance to to live in England for three months or, or do tours in Puerto Rico and Japan. And then, you know, over there, you're meeting these other random people from all over the world. Like, uh, you know, just... Um, just, just people from all over the world, you, you mm-hmm. meet up in this one place and you have no choice, but to form relationships relationships. And, you know, you can make a choice to be a shithead and be mean to people, or you could be like, I'm living my life. I love my job. I can't believe I've met, like I'm meeting new people. I assume they love their job. They're here working in England for $50 a night. Like, you don't, unless you love it, you don't, you don't do it. And so it's such a common thread for everybody. And so those are how the relationships are made. And then through that, you ask your friends to do a, a thing where they know they're safe. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, because I, it's between friends. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm not out to get anybody. It's not my intentions. I'm not looking at it. You know, I'm not looking for a quick, uh, clickbait or anything. And you know, my job with art of wrestling was really, I looked at it as a wrestling match. Like my job was to put you over, you know, like we're working together and I'm here to make you look as good as humanly possible. That was always the goal of it. And I wanted people coming out of that, you know, look being stronger than they were. And there's so many people, there's, you know, there's, there, this is, I'm not trying to like brag, but there's just so many people who came out of that, you know, being a better, being better in the public eye than they were before. Oh, that and not, no one, not uh, fans, not knowing things about them and you letting people finally get a glimpse. That's not on a, here's a WWE DVD. That's the same yeah. six questions. You know what I mean? You, well, that's why you'd come out better looking than you did before. <laughs> yeah. Is there, you said it like a lot of the times and it reflected on, it, they were your friends and they were buddies of yours and that, but was there, <clears throat> was there a guest of it or someone you had on the podcast that you can look back on and be like, Holy shit. Like I can't, who's, who's like the one that you go, I, I got, I can't believe he sat down with me uh, for an interview. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. You know, it was very surreal sitting down at stone cold, Steve Austin's house. Like I went to his house um, and we treated each other as equals. You know, I think that's the most, that's the most important part is that we treated each other as equals. Um, and I felt like an equal and in, in the wrestling world, you know, maybe in the podcasting world at the time, you know, we were equals, but obviously in the wrestling world and like how, you know, he's, he's like a no guy. relationship before that really. Right. Uh, was he he was calling me up, asking me questions about someone had given my number and he was calling and texting it because he was, he wanted to get in the podcast game. Okay. And I was, I gave him some advice and I told him what stuff to use and how to do it and to kind of get, how to get awesome. going. Yeah. And so that's how you form a relationship. And then of course, like, you know, I wasn't like, can I be on your show? Can you be on my show? Yeah. But like, I'll, I was thinking about this today. It's so funny you asked this. It's because um, you just kind of put like seeds in. Like I knew, like if he asked me in November, like I just knew eh, probably around March, he's going to be like, oh, I should have him on the show. You know, I'm not going to like beg him. And so I was thinking about when I how would have. How you know get, that? I how just, you, know you just know, cause I, as a podcaster, I know that you need guests and I know, you know, like that's, that's, I don't know. That's <laughs> crazy to me that in your mind, you'd go, I think stone cold Steve Austin, probably the biggest wrestler of all time. He has to have me on or, or not has to have me on, but the conversation would lead into a way where even where it would lead into a way where I would be like, Oh, you should come on. If that makes sense. Where I would ask him, because he was asking me enough stuff where it was like, oh, you know, it's just like, and that's the thing about forcing, ask forcing and not forcing is like, I would, I would be in a locker room with somebody and maybe I just met them, but I wouldn't, let's say it's you. And I I just met you and I knew you were a big WWE star and you've been on television. And like, I would just form a relationship with you. And then I would see you at the next time. And then I just knew some way it would come up organically where I could have you on like the next time, you know, in six months, you'd be in a locker room. I'd be like, Hey, we should do this show. And that it was, I think that's, that was one part of the success of that. Like I would like, I would always want these to come organically because I knew how much I hated asked, I knew how much I hated being on people's podcasts that I didn't know or, you know, that like I wasn't interested in being on. So I I just knew that there was a way of getting on shows. And I knew there was a way of asking people to be on my shows that would keep people in their safe space. And, 
you know me, I, I want, I don't want people to, you know, like, I don't want people to feel uncomfortable. I don't want people to feel bad. So I, I don't want to ask somebody who obviously doesn't want to do it, or they're just saying yes, because I don't want to yes, where I'm like, do my podcast. And then you just feel like you have to, like, I want it because to be like, approached, yeah, yeah, I want, I want a fun, yeah. let's have a conversation because we like each other. That's perfect. That, that makes perfect sense. Now that you say it now, going back to what you said about forming that relationship and seeing where that stuff with Steve would be going. That makes way more sense now to me yeah. of, of how you saw it coming and being able to approach him over time and not just being like, Hey, order these mics be on my podcast. Right. Right. Uh, and I don't even know who asked who to be on what I should actually look, I'll look back at my texts after this. <laughs> yeah. I that's, that's whoever sent it out first is very, very intriguing to me of was it him asking you or you asking him? We'll do a Patreon bonus where, where I rifle through my text messages with Steve Austin for you. I don't know. I still don't have one of those. <laughs> I, I still don't have a, one of those. A what tree on? A what tree on? A what, a what, is, that, uh, is that the the thing with the feet picks? That's the whole, no, that's, that's not, no, that's Patreon too. Patreon too? There's a second one? I don't like you. This is, this is, see. The sequel? Uh, how about the fact that you talked about you are a 42 year old man. And I am six years younger than you. And we talked about being on the cusp and you teach me about these things so much more than I would have ever imagined about what I need to do about the, about what I need to join. You'll mention, Hey, are you a part of this yet? Uh, no idea what it is. And you, I feel like you do that for so many people that just don't know it yet. Yeah. I, well, I, I don't know if that's, you know, it's funny because he's like, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm not selfish because like I do want stuff for myself and mm -hmm. like, you know, I, I probably do have some selfish tendencies, but also, you know, I, I always bring it back to this when, when I started wrestling and a lot of my friends started having success, like even you, you would be an example. It's like I started the Midwest in 1999 and I wrestled on all these shows and I'm hustling and I'm doing everything. And then I see, you know, you on who, one show with you before right, I got but, signed. That's right. It. It's crazy. And it was like you were part of that scene. But the, that upper Midwest scene was very small where we mm -hmm. we knew every wrestler, even if they debuted, it's like, well, there's a new person on the scene. Right. Yep. Whereas now there's eight thousand wrestlers, yep. which isn't isn't a bad thing. But it, the scene was so small. If you like debuted as wrestlers, we would go on that website and look who the wrestlers were. And we'd be like, who's yeah. this person? And then we'd do a search and we'd yep. AIM our friends who worked for that promotion be like, who's that person? You know, like, who is this person? So yep. whenever anyone had success, I was always so happy. And um, I think that's what it stems to is just like, I realizing that there's people and you hear the stories and I'm always like, that's crazy. That would be so jealous and, and upset that it wasn't them instead of that person. And I was just always like, there's space for everybody. Like, obviously I'm not going to take the role of, of, um, of Finley's, uh, little per, you know, like, what do you, yeah. why would you, who, I, and there probably were so many people who were mad, jealous and upset, right? Yes. Yes. And that's the crazy thing is how I, I really feel like the wrestling business and it's kind of a negative part here. I feel like the wrestling business, especially the independent wrestling business, is the weirdest thing of a lot of people aren't happy for others' success. And I feel like it stands out more than any other, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, like only because you you're in it and you know it so well. Like I you, guess, yeah, yeah. If I was in this business or that, I, I you'd see it there too, I'm sure. But man, it just stands out so much of how it's like. It's never a, oh, good for him. The first thing is a, why him? You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just, a, it's just a weird, a weird I, aspect. I, I was always like, it's gotta be somebody. So how cool is it that it's somebody I know? And you know. Yeah. That's always, it was always, and just naturally, it's not like I had to train my brain. So obviously my brain is that, that naturally goes that way. So I, na you know, I naturally want other people to have success in some spotlight or aspect or, yeah. um, you know, or it's like if you're starting a new endeavor and I have the skills to to say something or help something and you trust me and you understand that it's not coming from a mean way, like, why wouldn't I? But that all goes back to people being jealous, I guess. You know, like it's it's rough that some people have that. Um, and that all goes back to mentality. And, um, you know, hopefully they, you know, you, they can work on themselves. And if not, it's a it's a long, hard life. You mentioned the words new endeavor. 
which I needed to bring up at some point, a new endeavor you were part of that I really want to talk about and need the goss and the dirt on that is wrestling society X. Oh, I need that's not new. That's uh, 15 years. No, old. I understand that, but that was a new endeavor at the time that you were part of. And I, I, oh, I got it somewhere. There it is. A lanyard, a lanyard. <laughs> Please do not ever get rid of that. Oh, I'm making such a mess. There it is. Oh my God. M classic. Isn't that cool? What's the bat? Ah, it's the walkie talkie channel. Yeah. So let me say this please before there was, yeah, never get rid of that. Before there was never. whatnot, before there was whatnot, <laughs> which I am on pro wrestling tees, whatnot every Wednesday. When I got to the, when I, when, when uh, I was in WWE, Signed OVW. We were forced to move to Florida. Um, I lived with Matt Seidel and we weren't making any money. And I was like, I, I live in Florida now. I want to buy a hammock. And I didn't have any hammock money. That's a very not you. That, hold on. So now we go back to the very start of this conversation about how you'll penny pinch and penny pinch and penny pinch. But then certain things like, hey, I want a fucking hammock. Well, the story is I needed hammock money and I didn't want it to come out of my own paycheck. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so I was looking around to be like, what do I have that I could like sell to make money? And there was, I was living with Seidel, who's also in Wrestling Society X. And so we had, uh, I had two lan- lanyards. So I've had, I had three lanyards. This is the one I didn't sell that I kept that said Matt Classic, but I had two other ones that I had saved, obviously for one day to sell them to try to make some money. Um, and this was the time to make some money. And so I remember I put them up on eBay. I think they went for 50 each. Uh, we had $100 and we bought a hammock. And, um, and that that's like you think about it now that like, well, maybe they maybe that is what they would go for on whatnot. But um, I got rid of two of those in 2006. Uh, and I and I realized as I was doing it, Dylan, I realized it was something. I mean, I love the way you said beyond the mat in the beginning, the way I did the wrestling road diaries. I just love obscure stuff in the world of wrestling. We're going to hit on that. <laughs> a lot we're gonna hit on that so much when it comes to things that you've done and been a part of but the wrestling society x like what did what did it start from the ground up what did it what what was the vision like because it's like if people haven't seen it it's such like a fun presentation and for what it was at the time it was never seen like wrestling wasn't seen like that so i knew this was like a weird hit like obscure thing. I was 26 at the time. I loved MTV. Um, I, I thought, you know, all the other shows were great. Um, at the time, you know, I had heard that Kevin Kleinrock and big rock, I think big rock productions or something like that. Um, and then, so later, uh, have you ever seen the movie Molly's game, which is a, think, which, which, is a which is a girl who cheated uh, at, or, or like embezzled money from a big stakes poker game. And so one of the, Three, three movies rules that you see. No, three rules to oh, movies. Muppets. No women. Oh. <laughs> Muppets, Disney, or it has to make me laugh. And that's I don't see movies otherwise. That was okay. my three. This is and not it. This is not uh, by the sound of it. This is yeah. not any of those. This was like the she was the queen lady of this like high stakes hold'em game. Okay. And in that game was this guy named Kevin. In the movie, he was portrayed by I think like like Leonardo DiCaprio or somebody, you know, like he was portrayed by a famous actor and he owned this production company. That was the production company that ended up not paying allegedly that allegedly didn't pay all the backyard wrestlers, big vision. That's what it was called. Big vision. Oh, so he had made so much money and, you know, Josh prohibition and M dog never made any money from that. And Sanjay really? too. What? Yeah. Never made any money from those. Those made millions of dollars. Yeah. And he gambled it all away and then ended up being portrayed in a movie. But um, so this was his thing. He had a production company. He pitched it to, to MTV uh, through with Kevin Kleinrock on board. Now, I was not part of it at all, but I had heard that MTV was doing a show and he was using some like IWA Mid-South people, you know, Tyler, um, Tyler Black and Jimmy Jacobs. And like he was using XPW people and IW Mid-South and I wasn't on it. And I wanted to be on it so bad because I knew it would be so cool to be part of an MTV show. And at the time I was doing so many velocity and heat matches yep. that I said to the guy like, hey, they're about to offer me a deal. I said this to Klein Rock. They're about to offer me a deal. 
Um, but I think I'd like to be a part of this show. And obviously did they you, weren't you did, offering me. And you didn't, be, did you believe that? Or was that no, your, no, 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 okay. no, 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 I didn't think so. That was no. your leverage to go against. That was hey, my leverage. You better pick yes. me up now before they do. Correct. And so he, he kept on saying he was going to use me for season two, but a, I didn't want to wait for season two and B, I, you know, who knew that, you, you know, <laughs> this thing. One. Yeah. Right. So he's like, all right, we'll make you like, you can come, you could be a jobber and then we'll start, we'll move you, um, you know, just be a masked man. And we'll, then we'll, we'll move you into this role we're going to do with you, Roger Strong and Matt Seidel being like these frat boys for season two. So I went and I was like, well, if I'm going to be a jobber, I'm going to make myself stand out in some way. And that's why I kind of, uh, developed this Matt classic gimmick. And then like Dave Marquez gave me his like old sweater and like a lot of people like helped out, like kind of like, because like, you know how it is. Like once you see something cool, it's, I think it's the same way with like the acclaimed or whatever. It's just like, everyone wants to add their, like you want to like be a part of like being like, this is how I can help make it cool. Like I yeah. want to like do the, you know, like the second the scissoring stuff starts getting over, I'm texting Bowen's like, you got to do this move. You got to do this move. Like it yeah. just gets me excited. Like that's how our creative, I think, our creative juices flow that way. So a lot of people started adding input into this Matt classic character. And so it just kind of got over, but it was seven days in Hollywood filming. You look back on it, I think newfound glory. And I think yep, like they were part of it, like Weezer maybe, or so, yeah. you know, I don't just so many random, um, uh, Brett Ernst, who was in the, in the Cobra Kai TV show, like he was the commentator and it was such a weird mix of, um, Hollywood and LA and it was almost and, like the, the early, or like the earliest thing of like how Lucha underground was shown and, mm -hmm. and that, how that became kind of a out there kind of out of nowhere production. That was the, the initial one of that. Yeah. Like uh, something different, right. That's all, yeah. you know, we love wrestling and there's only so much we can just watch straight up presented basic wrestling. So the same, the same stuff we watch every week. So to get that difference, and I'm, I love, listen, I love the alternative. I love the, I love the weird. I love the fringe. So give me anything that isn't just basic arena with four, four sides of, you know, even if yeah. I'll, I'll watch a six sided ring for a second, you know, did you with the Matt classic thing, because it stands out so much in my mind, just the whole, everything you do with it. Did you know, or did you think it would be such a hit? Or did you think it would just be, you'd be just this, just another guy? No, I, I thought it would, it's kind of like, the it different? kind of like the podcast. Like people are like, did you think it would work? I was like, yeah, I thought it would work. <laughs> like, That's great. Matt, yeah. Matt, I thought it would work because <clears throat> people didn't make fun of wrestling, like tongue in cheek that much at the time, that much, you know, Chikara was just kind of starting to become a thing, which is funny because later Matt classic would find a home in Chikara. Yeah. Um, but I tried to bring Matt Classic back a couple of years ago. And I, I do Matt Classic on Lucha Vavoom because it's just perfect for that show. Yep. But I tried to bring Matt Classic back for regular shows. And so many wrestling shows in 2020 or 2021 or 2022, it's all like we're all making fun tongue in cheek of wrestling that it just didn't work because it was just like another thing in a show. Whereas 15 years ago, uh, well, it stood out. Why do you think so that's 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 really interesting to me? of why do you think the other wrestlers are tongue in cheek uh, taking a shot or you know what I mean? Why do you, why do you think it's not just the, the more times are people smart, too smart? Like, too, yeah. The more, blog, the more blogs and the more times okay. that we talk about our matches and we have people, our guests on our podcast to discuss our match or on the network to talk, to break down our match and stuff like that. It's just the more it chips away at, at just how funny a Matt classic character would be, you know? Okay. You know, that I, makes I, way I, more, yeah. that's kind of my thought process. And I, and I don't care either way. Like I'm, I'm all for doing that. It's just that this character, it just kind of died because of those situations, the circumstances. When you started, did you see yourself as a wrestler's wrestler or as the ha ha thing? Or didn't you really have that mindset, you know, of the, because you're, while you're known for such a, uh, a, a independent and timely run, you're also known as the ha ha guy as such a ha ha guy and a fun, loving kind of free spirit guy. Do you, was that your vision when you first started or just your personality or that's just kind of what you morphed into? Uh, Dylan, I wanted to be white to cold Scorpio. Uh, hold on. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, for me, I don't know ECW. That's Flash Funk. Sorry, I, I wanted Flash. to be. <laughs> oh, okay, I wanted to be white. I wanted to be White Thunder, Flash Funk. You, as in the dancing, as in no, 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 no. no Too Cold Scorpio drops? wasn't. Yes, I just wanted to do all the moves that he did. No, this isn't real. Yes, <laughs> you did. I mean, he. That was the wrestling. To be that, honest, I wanted to be Jack Evans. There you go. And when I st- and I obviously, so essentially we both kind of we get these the things fence. in our mind. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we were shooting way way farther than our, bo- than our bodies would allow us to. <laughs> correct, correct. I, I kind of wanted to say that, but I'll let you say that. <laughs> I could say that's one of the the rules of I could get away with that. You can. Yeah. Have you tried flipping leg drop ever in your life? Yeah, there's man, there's some clips of me doing. Uh, starting out for a moonsault and then turning and do a flipping leg drop. And like, I did it three times. I love uh, when you pull out the moonsault to the, the, the Asahi because it just makes me laugh because I'm thinking, I don't know when his body would just say, Hey, let's do this. But now the mindset of you wanting to be too cold Scorpio. Yeah. I wanted to makes, be too cold Scorpio. Makes <laughs> yeah. like that makes, it makes all the sense now because I'm yeah. used to you doing the ha ha stuff. And then you'd pull that out. And I go, this doesn't make sense. Like, why would he tell, tell himself, hey, I'm going to, you know, bite a guy in the ass and then just do a moonsault? Because <laughs> I can. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> that's the wrestler I would want to see. That's uh, crazy to me. Yeah, I did the flipping tumbleweed leg drop. I was do, like in my early 20s, once against Chris Hero and I kind of hit it once against Chad Collier and my I hit him with my heel. But that made my kneecap go down and it hyperextended my knee. Uh, so I was fucked for a little bit. And the other time was to rugby thug Trent Baker. And I literally just sat on his head. Uh, and I can't believe like a horror movie is his head just didn't explode. <laughs> like, <laughs> and his eye. Like, um, and so a- after that, I was like, maybe I should stop doing this. But I, I like I kind of have it, but it's just not accurate enough. But he was so cool, man. Like Scorpio was cool. The other one was like New Jack. I wanted to like dive off of shit. Uh, I know. I was just like, he's so cool. You, this is, I just, to I, that's this what I thought you, when I was 18, like, that's what I thought what wrestling was, was moonsaults and diving off of shit. Like, <laughs> but you didn't want to get into like the, the, the fork use and like the hitting with keyboards and that you just wanted to dive off shit. I just, yeah. Like, because I, I was a, a, a jackass generation, right? So yeah. ECW and jackass, but like getting bloody never really did anything for me, but like, uh, kind of like extreme, like adrenaline did. And I didn't see being bloody and like hitting yourself the fork and cutting yourself as adrenaline. I just kind of saw that as like masoch- masochistic kind of, whereas like the jackass stuff I saw as like adrenaline. Cool. Um, Isn't, I had Wee man on here and just to have him on, who was literally like a hero of mine yeah. for obviously my guy, my stature. And just that being the jackass generation, thinking back, of how huge that show and the entity of that show and just how much it was a part of culture. Like you yeah. couldn't, you couldn't go down the street and say, Hey, and bring up jackass without someone knowing of it. It's nuts. And it's nuts about what they kind of got away with on MTV at that time, because it wasn't, I feel like that was like late attitude era where it wasn't, it was, it was later than that, where it was, it, it would have been looked down on more. I feel it wasn't nuts. It was cool. Like, well, I guess because at my age, it was, it was just so Way cool. cool. Like, how Way could you cool. not want to put that on television? Uh, if you're an executive. That, that the parents didn't come back at it so much. Yeah. That was my thing. Right. Remember like, uh, yeah, Beavis and Butthead would say the word fire and that they just, I, there's all these generations of this stuff. That Beavis, but my parent, my dad couldn't watch the three stooges because right. they would beat each other up. Right. So just whatever the thing is, is like, you're like, yeah. I can't, don't be that person to land in. Like, that's all I'll say. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, I, it, that's, that's exactly kind of how I raise him and just, do what you want. Well, I wouldn't don't say do be, what you want. Don't be, watch what you want. You know, that kind of thing. It's just don't be dumb with it. Have good that's, morals, of course. Of yes. Yeah. Correctly. Yeah. Um, um so, yeah. So, so, uh, and then funny came in is because then like, once you start training and learn the basics, you're like, Oh, I, 
I have to learn the basics of professional wrestling. I can't be doing stunt stuff. And they would yell at me when I would do stunt stuff in training. They'd be like, you, you know, like my trainers were pretty good about that. Just being like, this isn't a stunt. Like you have to learn how to wrestle. I was like, fine. Um, and so then once you learn how to wrestle, you want to just, you want to put those, you, you know, your first matches, you want to do a tackle, a drop down. You want to like do the stuff you're doing in practice in matches to show that you're learning yeah. and getting better. And then once I got comfortable, like my true self was a, a, a natural comedian or I liked comedy and funniness. And so I started just implementing it into um, the matches. And the more I did that, the more I really enjoyed that. And I was like, I want to explore this more. And this is the stuff I want to do. I, I want to be the wrestler that I want to see. And I, I you know, I, I can't be Scorpio and I can't be new Jack. So the other wrestler that I would want to see is someone who could make somebody uh, uh, to, to do audience participation and make people laugh. And so I really, you know, for the next 15 years or whatever it was explored that, that Avenue of figuring out comedy and wrestling. By watching others in that realm or just by trying it for yourself, almost like a stand-up act and Hey, this hit, this didn't work kind of thing. Yeah, a little bit of both. You know, not that many. There's only so many people at that time. Let's say 2003. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know, it wasn't it was a thing. Like, it was Kikutaro and uh, and and the partner he was doing with it. I always butcher his name, uh, Kuman or whatever it is. And yep. then, uh, you know, later, you know, as I became obsessed, as I went over to England, I would find the old. I would start watching all these old British tapes. And so then I started watching, you know, Les Kellett and Cat Weasel, and these were people in the sixties and seventies and Vic Faulkner kind of doing a touch of it, but they were, you know, they were representing it as sport. And then you see the Brazos in Mexico. And, and then even, uh, you know, when I was in WWE, I would ask for little people matches. Um, cause I was trying to study that kind of stuff. You know, they had, they gave us access to whatever we want. So I'd always yep. be like, yo, give me, uh, Lord Littlebrook and little Tokyo and Madison square garden. I'm sure they were putting on the best stuff. And like, cause it's not like they were doing, you know, either they're, they're like pulling crazy. the tapes and going, yeah, because <laughs> no one's wanted them. Like, you're the and first I, person that ever asked for them. I guarantee it. And I would take spots from those because it's just yeah. like you know the ones that I could that was you know acceptable because you know I and you could you could talk on this more is like it's like as a little person you're either doing like crazy extreme flying or comedy. I feel and maybe I, I'm wrong. I always say it's like Torito or Dink. Right. Like, and, yes. There's never an in between ever. There's Can never there be? I feel like. I feel like just released Dylan Postel was a little bit. I, I would actually try to wrestle a bit and, and do stuff. And that was probably my favorite, my favorite run I've ever had, you know, uh, besides the, the top stuff that I did with WWE, but really just having the mindset of, I need to kill it. Like I need to show that I can do this and, but then do an ass bite as well. And <laughs> unable to like, but that was, I always tried to do, more like a Tommy dreamer saw me at one of the ACW shows here that I ran, saw me do a second rope moonsault. And he goes, he goes, why have you never done that on a house of hardcore show, Dylan? I said, I don't know. I just, I do it here and there just because, and it's because I think I wanted to show I'm not just an ass biter, but now I've realized with how I feel that it's okay to <laughs> just be an ass biter. And that's, that's, it still works at times. Yeah. Um, but so what about do, like on a national level? Like, let's say it's not you. No, I feel like it has to be one or the other. Yeah. I Can feel like, but well, Torito too. Torito still did the, the bullshit. Like, I remember when we, when they, we started the stuff with Torito and I, and we had just a killer midget match, just killing. I can say it. You're okay. You're not going to get canceled. I said it. Uh, just a wrestling match. And we get to the back. We we're happy. We get to the back. Vince goes, God damn it. They don't want to see two little guys beat each other up. Where's the ass bite? And I go, and it was such like a wind out of the sails kind of thing. Like we had such a good one. And now that's right. That's but, one person who doesn't have a forward vision, but I, you yeah, know, I'm thinking of like the idea of like, sprinkle in. they were like Ronda Rousey, like women will never fight in UFC. And it's just like Ronda Rousey's too good. So, but, and now there's a whole women's division. Yeah. It's like hope, you know, I, you know, I, and I don't know if this is little person heat, but there's like, my, there will never Mike. be, I don't, okay. I don't, I don't think there are because let's be honest with ourselves. When you put midget wrestling on a poster or you put two midgets on a wrestling poster, how, the public eye can't have, can't get out of the mindset of the ass bite and the ref throwback. You know what I mean? A uh, 50 year old guy 
uh, isn't going to have the mindset of, oh, these two are going to have a killer match, just like everyone else on the card. So I, I've been seeing on my TikTok this micro wrestling. I don't know if you know those guys. And they're are some unbelievable wrestlers in there. Yeah. And I, the first thing I did was text Janela and go dude, like if you could put these guys in GCW and like, just have a man, like this could be like how, when they brought over Mysterio and psychosis and it's just like, they're like, Whoa, I didn't think this was pot like luchadors. What? Yeah. And you know, that's what I'm, I'm and I'm not, even, I'm not even, you know, one of you guys, but I'm hoping for that. Yeah. Like, it, you know, that, that's, I, 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 but there's also like any independent wrestling, there is the not as good of companies and and kind of you know back alley midget companies too. Sure. Um, relationships and uh, we you were talking about having relationships with people and and that and before we finish off, I have to talk about a certain relationship you have with the Juggalos and how much it makes me smile every time. You're a part of their shows. Where did that come from? Were you were you an ICP guy growing up? Did it was it just a hey a bucket list thing that you needed to do? Because I feel like when it comes to JCW and Juggle Championship Wrestling and anything they do, Colt Cabana is always in relationship with it. Well, I mean, I already brought up right Pierce getting three hundred dollars yeah. and my mind being blown. Uh, and then 20 years later, I would make the same amount of money. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I so obsessed with wrestling and then obsessed with ECW, really. And then, you know, uh, and Howard Stern, too. Right. Like as a kid, you know, I, my father showed me Howard Stern when I was eight years old, I think. Um, I, and so, I snuck it on the E-Network at, <laughs> at night. He would literally show it to me from I think it was on like New York 37 like okay. before, before it was E word, like in, you know, like, yeah. like in their very early yeah. days, it somehow snuck on Chicago weird channels. And, um, and so ICP was always on Stern and then ICP was in ECW. And I was just like, I don't know who these guys are, but if they love wrestling, like the way, if they're in ECW, like I want to know who they are. And I did like rap at the time and still do. And so then like, um, I searched out, uh, their music, AKA I had a friend who worked at Sam Goody. If you slipped him a $5 bill, he'd give you four CDs, which was, I think of the value of $25 at the time, maybe 30. So, uh, For, thank and you, now, are these like copied ones or are these legit? No, no, no. The, the one from Sam Goody, like the actual, <laughs> he was fired years later, but you know, <laughs> I still have so many CDs from that. Um, and, uh, just kind of like now it's not like I had, like, I'm not like obsessed with music. So I was just like, Oh, I'll get four of these ICB CDs. So, uh, so even in my teenage years, like I listened to them, I had those, uh, and I liked them because they liked wrestling. Um, okay. you know, I, I don't, I never bought any merchandise or painted my face or anything, but I liked them. I liked the music, uh, went to school in Michigan, people in Michigan liked ICP. Uh, and then, you know, like knew that they, they loved wrestling. We're putting on wrestling shows, was always jealous of these tours. And then, uh, later when I got fired from WWE, they were looking for someone to play a police officer at the time, um, dysfunction, a wrestler in Wisconsin, he was the weed man and he kind of put my name forward. And I was like, Oh my, like, this would be amazing. I finally, I'm, you know, like they know who I am because I was in WWE. I'm, I, they're working out of Michigan. That's a five hour drive. Uh, I made this like comedy sketch about becoming a police officer. And I think they just thought I would be like, cut a promo and be like, I'm officer Cole Cabana. But like, I, I made this kind of like mini movie and they were so blown away by that. That I would put the time it? and effort. Uh, it's on the internet somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think it's I, on YouTube. I'm going to seek um, this out. Now. It's really fun, actually. <laughs> um, uh, my improv partner, Nick Hausman, is, <laughs> is in it. Uh, yes. So uh, if you could find that. And, um, and so, you know, so they saw that I was 100% in. I also, it gave me a lot, like I owe a lot to them because they gave, they were running shows on Wednesdays when I got fired okay. as a wrestler, when I thought, so I was like very scared that my, that I wouldn't have money coming in. And then all of a sudden, like I'm getting booked on a Saturday, Fridays and Saturdays, but also Wednesdays. And so now I'm working like a three, four show yeah. loop. And I'm like, Oh, I could still do this as a wrestler. Like I, my schedule. And so I'm always grateful for that part of it too. And so, uh, also, um, these guys are DIY. They don't have any backing. They do it themselves. Like, you know, if you don't like, if you're not down with their message or whatever, you have to respect the hustle. 
And I respect it so much. I think it's so cool. I'm anti-authority too. And like, obviously they are. Um, and so, uh, you know, like I, we might not, I don't know, look the same or whatever, but you know, I think our hearts are in the same place for sure. I think that DIY aspect is the huge part of it is that's what you've always been and what you've always pushed for, especially with not just independent wrestling, but wrestling in general of just, Hey, if, if they're not making it for you, make it yourself. If you really believe in it, make it yourself. Uh, Find a cheap way to do it. Yeah. (laughs) Pro wrestling tease is the last thing I want to hit on. And, and it's the, it's the, it's because you have been obviously such a huge proponent in pro wrestling tees and that's done so much for so many people. And was it Ryan coming to you? Was it you going to Ryan and saying, Hey, there needs to be a, a, a system, a, a place for these independent wrestlers to kind of produce their stuff worldwide instead of just at a table here and then at a different table here and nothing in between. So in 2009, <laughs> I had this idea. Uh, there was only a handful of us that were selling merchandise on MySpace using our PayPal link. Okay. And I wanted to put together, I want, I think it was like me, Hero, Claudio, maybe Delirious, uh, maybe Jimmy Jacobs, a couple of whatever. And I wanted to make a, a website called merchtable.com where we could figure out how to put our own PayPal links on there, but it would just be one hub. Okay. Um, and, and, and I just never had the brain or manpower or know how to do it. Right. So that was something very early that I wanted to do. And that goes back to me being like, I don't want it to just be like me. Like if, if you're smart enough to know that this is something you want to do, let's all work together to get this done. And so, um, years later I found Ryan, I needed a t-shirt guy. We all know how gear guys, they all, they come and then they go cause they're not reliable. So I found t-shirt people. I had them over the years. Then, then they're not reliable. I found yep. Ryan, he had an actual store. So I was like, well, he's obviously committed to this. So, <laughs> um, and it wasn't a big store. It was a little store in Chicago. He's obviously doing stuff by himself. He was a startup, whatever. Uh, I found out he liked wrestling. Uh, we got a shirt done. Then I said, Hey, I'll promote your business. Uh, if you give me 60 free shirts on my podcast, um, which again was a hustle by me, but it also brought him a lot of bit, you know, brought him yeah. a lot of business. I saw that he was doing it. I started telling my friends, this is a new shirt guy. You can go to him. He's good. Everyone started using him. And then Ryan was like, I think we could take this model of me. His, his business called one hour tees where you get shirts in an hour. He would buy them you know, for six bucks. So he would buy the shirt for three, sell it for six, make $3 profit or whatever it is. Then he had to pay everything in between. So, um, and he's like, I think I could do this. And if we could sell, you know, he was like, if we could sell 30 shirts, that would be like $900 or, you know what I'm saying? Like his goal was to make 30 shirts a month. And I was like, if you can make that infrastructure, I'll get everybody on board right now. And so I, you know, I think I, I called up, I think it was Kevin Steen, the Young Bucks, Scrap Iron, Jimmy Jacobs, a couple other people. And I was uh, John Hennigan, Beth Phoenix. Uh, and I was like, okay, you know, here's like a group of us. Let's see if we can get this working. And then, you know, so like it was both of us scratching each other's back, him using what he knew how to use, me using what I knew how to use uh, and putting it all together. And I always say for Ryan, unlike me, as we learned in this whole thing is uh, – I know the principle you got to spend to make. I know that mm-hmm. we started off with that. You spend money on a zoom every month. You're crazy to do it, but I know it's the right <laughs> thing. I know it's the right thing. You got to spend to make, uh, I, it's just not in my heart. I want to, <laughs> I want to make to keep is what I want to do. <laughs> Some spend to make, I want to make to keep. <laughs> to keep. That's like, like one of the episode, right? There. You're welcome. And so Ryan, you know, Ryan's been putting billboards of me all over the city, which are not cheap. Uh, and that just shows he is not afraid to spend money to make money. And he he's put a lot of money into pro wrestling tees in order to make it what it is, in order to market it, in order to make products, in order to get stuff done. He's had a lot of fails. I, You know, it drives me crazy if I would put money into something and it just whooshed away. Uh, but he's had so many fails and that's part of being a business person and he's great at it. And so... Uh, It's just a magic formula that's worked. And I'm so happy, you know, and the story I tell Dylan is when Kevin Steen was on the Indies and he was working a job uh, overnights. And then all of a sudden he's like, I'm selling so many of these shirts and I'm doing absolutely nothing. And he quit his job doing overnight stocking at like a target or something. 
And because of that, he, he could put all his attention on wrestling. And I'm not saying we're responsible for making him go to the WWE and becoming <laughs> main eventing against Stone Cold Steve Austin. But that put, you know, the joy I feel that I, that I could help take a man out of a fucking target warehouse doing midnight shifts for him to just be able to make some money off of what he's great at is so high. And it's been, and it's been that for so many people, you know, so many people have been able to subsidize off of pro wrestling tees and, yeah. and hope and, and light a fire on it. You know, it's not just like, okay, you, you realize, okay, I can make eight bucks on a shirt that I sell. What else can I do? And then you go out and you start doing other stuff. It doesn't have to just have to be pro wrestling tees. You know, maybe it lights a fire under somebody. It really does. And it, and it, you got guys like from stone cold to me and everyone in between and guys that maybe is don't. that the top and the bottom? I guess, I guess height wise, baby. No, <laughs> damn it. There's the cancellation right there. There's the cancellation. <laughs> he's not that tall. You're right. He's not that tall. <laughs> But you have all of that or guys that work, you know, the, the once a month but or or whatever or that aren't on money shows. But when you get that T-shirt sale and it makes you feel or you get the the, the monthly you know thing and you go. Oh, I, I have people out there that still want to support and it makes you go, I think I'm doing this for a reason still. And like you said, it's a light the fire under the ass of, OK. I should keep doing this because people still want to support. Oh yeah. So how can they support you now? Well, this is, so you talked about everybody. Um, you talked about everybody taking me, giving everybody ideas, but this, this whatnot stuff has come from Hawkins and Ryder. Uh, I can't call them Cardona and uh, Myers. <laughs> it's so hard. I, I hate calling them that. I, I know it. Hawkins like, and Ryder just rolls off my tongue. Doesn't it? No one, I don't know anyone that calls him. It's like when I hear Cardona, first off, it makes me ugh because it's him. But secondly, because <laughs> because it's just how, not how anyone knows him. Yeah. You know, yeah. Him as Hawkins and Ryder. Yeah, of course. But uh, I've been having a lot of fun with whatnot. And it's the best. It is in the my best. closet, I just have so much stuff of stuff I've collected over the years that I've always been like, I, I'm like, one day I'm going to get rid of this. I don't know how, but one day I will. And this is the perfect way to do it. I have it um, written down. We're going to let me let me pause that real quick. I have it written down as when I stayed at your house one time, I got the tour, a.k.a. I just walked around and snooped. How do you have a method to your collection or is no. it just, hey, this is really funny and it makes me laugh and smile. I'm going to take this home. Yes. Well, it's never it's not always a I can make money off this one day. Oh, I have a lot of, I'll, I'll always take posters and stuff from my wrestling shows. So a okay. lot of it is that a lot of it is that. And then a lot of it's just like weird, cool stuff that I'm like, I should have this with it, knowing that like probably in 10 years, I could probably make some money off of it. It blew my mind. Some of the random just figures <laughs> and posters and just collectibles and memorabilia that you had. I was like, oh, this is, this is really cool because it's it either made him laugh or it's special to him. Do you have an item in your collection that's not Outfit, like not maybe not worth something like a, a ton to someone else, but something to you that you're like, this really means a lot to me. Like, right, I'll show you. Me, I'll this, show you a couple uh, of things here. Yeah. All right. This is taking this off the wall. Oh, I found this at an auction somewhere. I don't know where I found it. This is from Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling. This is uh, a cell. Now my brother is a cartoonist. Yep. And so he would collect animation cells as a kid. Um, and so this is an animation cell from Hulk Hogan's Rocket of Wrestling, which is cool because I remember him collecting it. But it's also it says the art of wrestling. Wait, like, wait, 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 wait. Why does it say the art of wrestling? Because this was part of the cartoon in 1987. I thought someone made that for you. No, no, this is a, an official. This is a, this is like an official animation cell uncolored. From Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling 1987 ca cartoon. It's great. Okay, right? that's incredible. It's I great. thought someone literally made it for you and just like, that's awesome. That's something like hits close to home for you and like is part of childhood as well. That's great. Let me see. Here we go. You're not taking it out. Uh, this letter of authenticity certifies that the accompanying piece of our original productions use copies. 
The, these pieces are from the DIC show Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling. They are each title card from the original artist and have not been on the market before 2018. There are all, these are the only ones known to exist and have been stored in a private collection for over 30 years and are the most complete set kept by the artist. Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling was a show from 85 to 86. I confirm the authenticity of these materials. No part of this package has been altered in any way. Arton Ingram. There you go. That's crazy. Yeah. What That's, is it said? A DIC. What does that mean? Dick? It was it was a it was a channel and like a broadcasting thing. Oh, that's right. I believe, yeah, I believe Muppet it, Babies dick. was part of it. Uh, and I would always laugh at that because it was always say dick on the screen. It was for children. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> is there something uh that hits like for you, like to me, the, the WLC table piece is yeah. huge to me because it's something mm -hmm. from my career that I've done that I'll never get rid of. Is there, yeah, you, do you have something like that? I do. You, you ready for this one? Hold on. Okay. This will be good. <laughs> now this, I framed this. Okay. This was uh, Colt Cabana merchandise, T-shirts, $30, 8 by 10s $10. So, someone made that? They made that for you? I, I think D, uh, DDT did. We're not going to get better than that. <laughs> <laughs> that wraps up all of this, everything we've talked about. I got it world framed. Traveling, world traveling to merch to just making money. That wraps everything all into one. That's great. That's, that's so great. good. Yeah, this that's is so a merch good. sign. Uh, and it just, I, I thought it was so cool that it, like, it's me hustling, even even hustling in Japan to try to sell some t-shirts in 8x10s. It might uh, have been New, New Japan too, or, or D, I think DDT though, to be honest. And you traveled with that? Yeah, I brought it home, of course. I mean, but not you frame. travel to, to shows with that? Oh, no, it was just, it was just I, I think they, they would make one every night. So there's different ones, but that was the uh. one I grabbed. So whatnot is where I'm at, but I'm hosting for Pro Wrestling Tea. So just go to, you know, but every week I do five of my own items. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to do once a month where I, I'm calling it Colt's Closet, where it's just going to be a, a bunch of my, there's so, I have so many little things that I just want to get rid of that aren't worth that much, but I'd love to like just have people have them. Uh, and then, you know me, I'm on Twitch. I'm really enjoying Twitch. I'm not like, which isn't becoming like it's not this like crazy money maker, but it's still really fun, fun. for me to do. It's a yeah, fun I really community. enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoy it. And I've I, I didn't play video games before. See, and I did, and everyone yeah. yelled at me for years now. Why aren't you doing this and and trying to make money doing it? And I was like, no, I don't want to. I just want to play video games at my house. <laughs> yeah. And now, like, I saw other people like having fun doing it. I was like. Also, I don't like change, as you know. I hate change. I hate trying to learn new things. I don't like it because it makes me feel stupid. Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh, whatever. So I talked to George Fees from the Game Marks pod, and he literally said, Am send me a list of things I need to buy on Amazon, and I'm going to literally hit buy now to all of it and spend whatever I need to just get it done because I don't want to look around. I just want to get the whole setup done. Right. And it I love it. I really, really love doing it. And it's, it's another virtual meet and greet, which brings people together. And it makes a community of, I've never met this person in my life, but now they come up to a, the merch table and be like, Hey, I'm this guy from Twitch. Sweet. It's so and you fun. Feel Isn't like, that when that happens? You feel like you know him yeah, because you that. interact with, and you've never met him in your life. So. I always feel awesome. like there's something more special when someone comes up and they're like, I'm, Gamer, gamer man, 35. And I'm like, gamer, man, you're a real person. <laughs> I think it's because it's something that we, uh, that, that we did on our own that no one else produced for us or, or put us on. We made this. And so yeah. when someone we're also really spending a lot of time that, with those people. Yeah. 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 It's, so we're forming relationships. <laughs> yep. yep. Awesome. Well, thank you, buddy. Uh, yep. I, I, I really appreciate this and I appreciate you sitting down uh, and doing this with me, um, your, your, all of your plugs will be in the description below, but make sure to like comment, subscribe, smash the bell. So, you know, every time we do a fun interview, like we did today with Scotty Goldman, uh, Mac classic, classic Colt Cabana, 
Twinkie the Kid and everything else that you know him by. You were on that show, I think, right? Yo, I was thinking about that the other day. I was blown away. Me, you, and Hero. Uh, Was Tyler Black? Tyler Black was on the show. Maybe. Or on the second one. He was on one of them. There's so many Midwest independent guys on that show. What was it? TT? Totally Tool Wrestling. Totally Tool Wrestling. By Sydney Bacabella and Joey Eastman. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Thanks. Colt Cabana. You forgot that name. 